Welcome to our discussion about the Gospel of Luke. We have um, gone through and discussed the Gospel of Matthew, and we uh, examined the nature of Matthew as a gospel written to a primarily Jewish or Judean audience, um, the, and a great place to kind of begin with that is to go back and look once more at the genealogy. Uh, the G Matthew's genealogy, and so before we get to the Gospel of Luke, I want to show you Matthew's uh, genealogy. Often we just skip this entirely. Um, sometimes when you're talking about reading Scripture and you have this in your plan, you get to Matthew chapter 1 and you blink twice and you end up in chapter 2. But uh, this is actually a, uh, I'm going to try to go through this uh, quickly, but yet to give you a sense of how a redactor, how Matthew, in this case, shapes a tradition of Jesus's uh, genealogy and shapes it to the unique purpose of his, of his gospel. So here's the genealogy. It is, um, you can look at these different lists of of names to get a sense of where Matthew might be picking up some of you know his source material. Interesting. When you compare these in a in a in a really um, tight way, you do get the sense that Matthew has adjusted some of the names and some of the generations in order that it fits his threefold scheme. And what is his threefold scheme? If you look here, he begins with Abraham in verse two. The first set goes to King David. So uh, that's the first set of 14 generations. And then from David to the deportation of Babylon is a second set. And then the third set from the deportation of Babylon to, um, to Jesus himself, you have another set. Well, in order to make this work and be perfect in terms of 14 generations apiece, some of these generations either get short shrifted or or adjusted. Um, so Matthew's point is to embed the genealogy of Jesus within the context of kind of like a perfection. And he does that um, by taking some liberties with the genealogy lists from different places in the Old Testament. And you can compare those. If your Bible is like this and you have the notes, you can go back and you can look at these notes and say, okay, let's check to see if um, if the order is correct, if um, if Matthew preserves uh, everything down uh, in a in a in a good way, it's interesting also to see that the chronicler has some aspects. Look at uh, if as I have that highlighted verse four in the box there. His daughter-in-law Tamar also bore him Perez and Zera. Um, that is a, that's a, these are key points that Matthew will uh, preserve within his genealogy. So let's take a look at it a little bit more. Um, Abraham is the father of Isaac, Jacob. Now, what, we, what do we don't have here? We don't have Adam. And I point that out because Adam will be the, uh, you know, the first well, Adam was actually the last in the genealogy list that um, uh, that Luke will use. But look how it works here. Uh, in Matthew's genealogy, three sets of 14, you also have the introduction of some interesting characters, and the first one is Tamar. And as the chronicler said, she is the daughter-in-law of Judah. And how does the daughter-in-law of Judah have sons by him? And the answer is that Tamar had been widowed, uh, and as a widow, the Leverett Law, L-E-V-I-R-A-T-E, -E, Leverett Law, is kind of like the Social Security, the Bible, but it's all tied up in family relationships. And if, if a wife was widowed, then she would be entitled to live with the next son of, the, of, the, of her husband, and that's the way it worked. Um, in order that she might be cared for and her children would be cared for as well. Judah doesn't do that. When, um, when Tamar's husband dies, Judah's son, 
he does not furnish Tamar with a husband. And Tamar must entrap Judah, and she she dresses up as a harlot, a uh, prostitute, and lures uh, Judah. And then nine months later, when she's found to be pregnant and having a child, Judah is, is furious, saying, you know, well, I'm not going to give you to one of my sons now, and tries to get an explanation. You can find this in Genesis. Uh, Tamar puts down, she is, she has taken from Judah as payment his signet ring, uh, which, uh, you know, so Judah has given this to her, and she says to Judah, I'll tell you who is the father of the child if you can tell me who owns this signet ring. And it's a glorious piece of, of uh, scripture there. And in any case, Tamar is included in the list. Look who else is here. Uh, Rahab. Now these two, Rahab and Ruth, two women, uh, both of these are Gentile women. Um, Rahab was in the city of Jericho when the walls fell, and she has claimed that uh, she's claimed uh, kind of like a asylum within uh, the Jewish, the Israelites. Um, as the owner of a brothel, she has housed uh, the Israelite spies. That's You can find that in the book of Joshua. And, um, oh no, sorry, that's not, that's not correct. She, she houses these spies, that's, that's back in numbers. And when they are, um, when they're ready to leave, she says to the spies, please, please, uh, remember me when you come to take Jericho, they come to take Jericho. And, uh, she ties a, um, she ties a crimson fabric to the, to the, frame of her window and she, her, you know the day is saved look up here you can see that here in this um in this little uh genealogy list from ruth notice here though uh perez to hezron to ram aminadab neshlon neshan to salmon salmon boaz so the women don't appear why why is it that matthew includes rahab the prostitute owner uh, the you know the brothel owner, uh, and and then then Ruth. Ruth, of course, you remember from uh, her relationship with her mother-in-law Naomi. Ruth and her sister-in-law Orpah are married to brothers. Um, Naomi and her husband move from the from Bethlehem. Literally, Bethlehem means house of bread. They moved from there uh, to Moab because of a famine. So there's no nothing to eat in the house of bread, and that pushes Naomi and her, her daughters-in-law and her sons and her husband to Moab. All of the males die. Naomi comes back and, again, according to the Leveret Law, tries to establish the next line of relationship, and she comes up with Boaz. And so Ruth is the one who is... Uh, is given to Boaz. And look, she functions as she is here in the list uh, that ends up with David as the king. And basically the book of Ruth, this little book here, is a an explanation or a celebration of David the king. Um, and so she appears in the genealogy. All of these, th you see all these texts are integral to uh, Jewish history. And the first set of the first set of genealogy records gives you the sense of hope that that, that, that things are good and, and that things are promising. Not so with the second. Look how the second begins. David, the father of Solomon by his wife Uriah, the wife of Uriah. So Bathsheba isn't even named here. Um, you don't get that uh, piece of scripture uh, from Samuel, Second Samuel, you don't get that here. Uh, what has David done? He's taken the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, while Uriah is on the front lines of the battle, and he has had an affair with her, by which a child is born, that child dies. Nathan the prophet declares the punishment for their sin, and when Uriah, uh, Uriah is killed too, because David puts him on the front lines of the battle in order that he would fall, and then he takes Bathsheba for himself. Uh, nasty, right? Uh, so the beginning of the second set of genealogy records begins with this kind of ominous turn. 
uh, Solomon to Rehoboam. And when you get to Rehoboam, there's there's this un, unstated chasm here because after Solomon, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the kingdom divides between the north and the south. And so that is also implied here in this mini history lesson. And that history lesson continues until you get Hezekiah, which of course the deliverance of of uh, Jerusalem from the Assyrians, and then Hezekiah to Manasseh, Manasseh to Amos, Amos, Josiah, Josiah, the Jeconiah, to the deportation to Babylon in 586. So this second set, if the first set is all the promise, the second set is it all goes down the toilet from Matthew's point of view. And then the final set, the uptick. After the deportation to Babylon, here comes the return. Uh, and the, uh, the it's not stated, uh, but Zerubbabel is one of those guys that has a key role to play in the reconstruction of the new temple. And so you get that. And then Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. Messiah is the Jewish term for the anointed one. And this, um, uh, as the anointed one, um, as the chosen one, as the one that God would use, uh, Jesus provides the redemption to Israel's history and to the history of the Jews, taking up that really nasty bit and moving it. So that look at how Matthew ends it, the generations from Abraham to David, 14, David to the deportation to Babylon, 14, from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14. And then you have the birth of the Messiah, which takes place um, in, in this way, uh, and, and everything in the Matthew's birth story, there is a tight parallelism with Moses and Moses's birth story. So Matthew, again, is a Jewish, uh, gospel. It's, it's got that kind of an audience, even if it's polemical. And what I mean by that is even if Matthew's job is to say that Jesus is the fulfillment to Judaism and the Jews who are antagonistic to that, have to be defend. You have to defend against them. It the uh, a Jewish culture, a Jewish mindset is in view. So let's compare that genealogy with Luke's, and for that we have to go to Luke four. Actually, Luke three. Luke three. So it goes in reverse order. That's the first thing. The son, as was thought, of Joseph. Notice how he doesn't have Mary here. We already have met Mary and Jesus' uh, conception by the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, can, you can identify that. Um, and he goes through. No, uh, you see how there's like no real um, comment. The women are not here. And we go all the way back to Adam. Why is that important? Because Luke has a Gentile audience in mind. And a Gentile audience would be an audience wide open to, uh, rather than restrictive to Jewish sensibilities, um, you know, you've got in Luke, the, 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 he, Luke is pointing to Rome. That's ultimately where Luke is pointing. And you can find that by, by examining Luke on the one hand and Acts on the other. Those two books, both both presumably by Luke. Um, the author there is trying to draw a line continuous with the gospel message spreading with the Holy Spirit as a main agent with from, from Jesus into Paul. And, and so that is Luke's uh, main point of view. Going back to Matthew for just a second, isn't it interesting that uh, the, I wonder if I could just uh, punch this here. Let's see. Um, isn't it interesting that you have within this genealogy these five scandalous women, Gentiles, there's something is is a, a little bit atypical. Uh, Sexuality is involved with Tamar, certainly with uh, Rahab. Uh, Ruth is a, is a story of faithfulness, uh, but she'd been married before, you know. And then, of course, uh, Uriah, the wife of Uriah, that's Bathsheba. Of course, that's a, that's an indictment. And then finally, Mary. And so it's it's a it's an unusual juxtaposition of five 
women who are given agency here, who are given uh, character here. So it's, it's a